Well, we've made it to the middle of 1 Peter chapter 3, and in so doing, we've really made it right to the heart of the book of 1 Peter, Re- really the substance, the meat of, of the, the whole book we're going to find here in, in this chapter. And so, maybe not an easy ser- a sermon, but a sermon telling us, here's what it looks like to really live out your Christian faith. I want to start by reminding you kind of the theme of the the book of 1 Peter. Of course, Peter's writing to Christians who have been scattered because of their faith, and so they're being persecuted. They've left home and family and really going through very difficult times, and the theme of the whole book really is how to live as a Christian in the evil world in the midst of persecution, and so that's what the book is about, but more recently, we've, we've come across chapter 2, verse 12, which I told you when we, we covered that verse served as the, the theme for the middle of the book. Really, there's three sections in, in this book. The, and, and when we get to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, this becomes the, the header, if you will, for section 2. And it simply says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when he, they speak against you, and I could add the words, and they will, when they speak against you as evildoers, they will see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And then the next section really is about what that looks like to live out a life that's honorable and a good life. Here's what it looks like to live as a Christian in the face of persecution. Live in such a way that they'll see your good deeds and somehow glorify God. And Peter, again, he's writing to people that are suffering because of their faith. It's not that we won't suffer. We will suffer. But the section here talks about how we can redeem that suffering for good. How we can use that suffering to be molded and shaped into the image of Christ. How we really can have... Suffering help us mature, and that's what he's writing to. I, I want to tell you, for my kids, one of the, the things I want most in life is to, to raise them to maturity, not just so I can kick them out of the house and say, okay, go, but, but really to, to raise them to where they can live as adults in, a, in an honorable way, live lives of integrity, and really live as an adult in society. But I've got to tell you, even more than that, here's what I want for my kids. I want them to mature in their Christian faith. I want them to become young men and and women of integrity and faith and morality that'll take a stand for what's right and wrong. I I want to to see them grow up in Christ. And so that's what I want most of all for my kids. And and actually, that's what I want for our church, that we grow up into maturity, become more like Christ, and I can stop individually and say, that's my desire for you, to present you complete in Christ, to help you mature. This passage, maybe as as much as any in the book of 1 Peter, is going to show us what it looks like to grow towards maturity. And so that's where we find ourselves in a, in a hard section, but a meaty section of the book of 1 Peter. So I hope you have your, your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 3. Notice verse 13. Now, who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what's good. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you'll be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. In this passage, again, writing to people who are being persecuted, Peter actually gives them these marks of, uh, of maturity. He gives five Christian principles, uh, suggesting here's what it looks like to, to grow up in Christ. And so he's going to tell you, here's what you need if you really are going to live out the Christian faith. Here are those marks of maturity. And he starts by, by saying, first of all, a mark of a, a mature Christian is this eagerness to do good. And he asks a question. I want you to notice this question. He says, who is there to harm you if you're zealous uh, for doing good? And it's a rhetorical question. Usually when we're asked a rhetorical question, the answer is obvious. You don't need to say it. It's not written for us. And usually the answer, we might be tempted to say, well, no one. And I want to stop and say, be careful. Yes, this is a rhetorical question. But the answer is not no one. Who is there to harm you if you're zealous for doing good? And the answer is, Actually, there still will be some people. This is a rhetorical question that has a proverbial aspect to it. And here's what I mean by that. If you do good things and if you live out your righteousness, it really may lessen hardship against you. But the truth of the matter is, who is there that wants to harm you, especially if you're zealous for doing good? There still are people. And you're still going to suffer. And so we need to stop and be careful how we answer this. But he is saying that good deeds might lessen your opposition if you're zealous. And it's interesting, that word zealous is a a word you'll see that it's actually just a translation of the Greek word. It's the very word from which we get our word zealot. 
And that, that's a, the word that means enthusiastically ardent in doing good, eager and passionate about doing right. And so who's going to harm you if you're zealous, if you're enthusiastically doing good? And that word good, it's actually much broader than just our word good. It means upright or beneficial. It means being kind and benevolent. And so if you're really seeking the needs of other people and you're really kind and you're really generous and you're ardent about doing that, you're zealous about doing good, who's going to harm you? And be careful because the question is, there still are some, but certainly it's going to lessen opposition. But here's the first characteristic of a mature Christian. You're zealous. You're enthusiastically trying to do good for other people. That you're doing what's right and you're doing what's beneficial and you're really trying to, to live out a life of thoughtfulness and kindness to other people. That's what it looks like to be a Christian. But understand, there might still be some people who harm you in this world, but that, that's the whole book. You will be persecuted for doing what's right. But the ultimate answer is this. Who's going to harm you for doing good? Ultimately, well, no one is. We understand that the ultimate answer is found in, in God and the fact that he's watching. I can take you to Romans chapter 8, which really asks the very same question. It says, who shall, who shall separate us from the, the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are, more, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, the mark of a Christian is doing what's right, doing what's good, doing what's honorable, really living a life of kindness and compassion no matter what's going to happen. And so he tells us, here's a mark of of Christianity, here's a mark of maturity, that you're eager, you're zealous for doing the right thing no matter what. Do good even if you might suffer. And by the way, you will. Which leads really to the second characteristic. Not only this eagerness, this, this zealousness for doing what's right no matter what, but willing to suffer in spite of that. In fact, he goes on to say, but even if you should suffer, and again, I could stop and say, and you will, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you'll be blessed. And so if you go and do good deeds and you are kind and generous, it really, for the most part, might lessen suffering, but there will be people still who persecute you. But we need to have this attitude no matter what. I'm going to do the right thing no matter what. I'm going to be kind no matter what. I'm not going to respond in kind. I'm not going to dole out persecution just because I'm being persecuted. I'm going to do the right thing because it's the right thing. And I've got to remind you where, where Peter's taken us so far. He's actually said, if you want to be mature in Christ, it means putting on the marks of Christ. We're supposed to follow his example, and he's told us what that looks like. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21, he, he tells us, For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Be like Christ who, by the way, was generous and kind and faithful, and yet people still lashed out at him and persecuted him. You will be persecuted even when you do good. Let me just tell you, kids at school, if you don't join in with the activities, the evil activities of other people, there will be other kids that mock you because you fail to join in with them and their evil deeds. Uh, associates, when you go to work, there might be some people who scoff at your belief in God and they mock you because you're a Christian. In fact, you might even work for an employer who will attack you if you fail to cook the books or fudge the billing or somehow cheat on, on what's right. You see, if we do the right thing, there will be some people who persecute us. You can have family and friends who might even consider you a religious fanatic if you try to faithfully follow Jesus. And so, guess what? You can do the right thing and follow the right course and still have people who wanna persecute you. There's been times as a minister that I've, I've suffered for Christ, not really in any, any big ways, but there's been times I remember, and you know I love, I love cars. I walked out and somebody had keyed some nice language in the side of my car, taken their car key and put filthy words engraved right in the side of my car. There have been times when I've had people curse me out, but the truth of the matter is I've certainly never suffered like Christ. I've certainly never suffered like most people in the world and what it means to them when they become a Christian. I've not suffered like my friends in China who it might mean losing family or friends or their job or receiving black marks because of their faith in Christ. I've certainly not suffered like Saeed. Uh, we know that he's in prison for the next, what, seven years because of 
his willingness to go and help other people or certainly not suffered like, like people last week in Syria when 85 died because they were simply worshiping God. Peter says, you know, you can do good things and you should have an eagerness to do good things, but understand there will still be people who attack you. We need to have this willingness to suffer and do the right thing no matter what. You must do the, and that's his point, do the right thing no matter what, even if there are consequences, even if it means suffering. And, and oh, for people, for Christian people who would stand up and say, I'm not going to bend, I'm not going to bow. Or for Christian people say, I will be a person of integrity and I will do the right thing no matter what. And oh, for Christians who would stand up and say, I'm not going to react in kind. I'm going to treat people as Christ treated me. And so though they persecute me, though they lash out at me, though they ridicule us and mock us and scoff at us, we will stand up and be people of integrity and we will react with kindness rather than in kind. Understand, that's what it means to be a Christian. To, to be known for our eagerness to do good and be willing to suffer for it. But notice, as, as Peter tells us that we're supposed to be willing to do good and even suffer for it, he also promises us a blessing. Notice the promised blessing if you do in our passage here, but even if you should suffer for righteousness, and I say you will, you'll be blessed. Or we can go later on in the book of 1 Peter when we get to chapter five. He's gonna say, and after, all, after you've suffered a little while, the God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, and notice this, these words, God himself will restore and confirm and strengthen and establish you. Now just stop and think about those words. God himself will do these things. And what wonderful that words they are. He'll restore you and confirm you and strengthen you and establish you. Do you realize the great promise here? If we are willing to do the right thing, if we're willing to do the right thing even in spite of the consequences, if we're willing to take a stand for truthfulness and integrity, that even if we're persecuted here, God will strengthen us, that he will confirm us, that, that God will establish us. And I want to tell you, those are great promises. Oh, for people who'd stand up and do the right thing no matter what. Uh, it's interesting that throughout 1 Peter, and sometime I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this study. Throughout 1 Peter, I've been referencing the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus speaking, and, and I, I've got to stop and remember, man, it's like Peter heard Jesus teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. And then we remember, of course, Peter heard Jesus as he was teaching the Sermon on the Mount. And so there's great comparisons between 1 Peter and the Sermon on the Mount. And again, we, we find this, and I want to take you to the words of Jesus recorded for us in the book of Matthew. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice, be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You see, we're offered this blessing by God. Not only he will strengthen us and establish us and keep us, but we're, we're promised a blessing if we stand up and do the right thing no matter what. And so Peter's advice is simply do good. Don't fear those who persecute you, but you do the right thing no matter what the consequences are. And so this eagerness to do good and a willingness to suffer for what's right. And then we come to the heart of the passage. He tells us, here's what it looks like to follow Christ. It's this devotion to him, a devotion to Christ Jesus as Lord, honor Christ as Lord, set Christ apart as holy. And what's really interesting here, it's, there's a phrase that's really hard to translate, and I don't know how to explain it other than the word holy, we understand the word holy, is used as an imperative. That's a command. So how do you say holy in command form? Do you holy eyes? Do you, right? And so what, what our Bibles have to do is actually split the section up. And so you understand this word holy set as a command. And so your Bible might say set apart Christ as holy or consider Christ as holy or honor Christ as holy. We, we have to kind of figure out how to translate that. But here's what we're supposed to do in our life, in the way that we live. Our life should be that that really pronounces the holiness of Christ. We need to honor the Christ the Lord as holy. We've got to set him apart as holy. We've got to dedicate our lives to him as holy. We've got to sanctify the Lord in our heart as holy. We've got to make our, our hearts a holy residence for Christ. You see, that's the command. You set him apart as holy in your life. You set him apart as, as Lord, Christ as Lord. And I've got to stop and say, here's the key Jesus has got to be Lord of your life. 
You can't simply give Jesus lip service. If you want to really be the kind of Christian that God wants you to be, if you want to have the mark, the characteristic of Christ in your life, then he's got to be your Lord, which I've got to say, the word Lord, really in this sense, it's the word boss. He's in charge, and he's in charge of every area of your life. And again, it's not just lip service. It's actually in what we do and how we live, and our lives are this temple for him. It's a holy residence. Lordship is the key to godly living. And when I say set him apart as Lord, it's not just words. It's your actions. Authentic lordship must be lived out in obedience to Christ and the way you live and how you act and how you conduct yourself. In fact, Jesus himself says, a lot of people say, Lord, but do not do what I tell them. Many people on that day will say, Lord, Lord, and Jesus will say, I don't know you, depart from me, you, you, you workers of wickedness. You see, the key to living a Christian life is saying, Jesus, you're Lord of every area of my life, and I'm going to live for you. My life will be a holy residence for you. I'm going to honor you in everything I do. And so here's what that looks like. As we make Jesus Lord, we're going to be eager to do good and a willingness to suffer for him. We'll do the right thing no matter what. And again, I've got to stand up and say, oh, for people of integrity. Oh, for people who won't bend or bow. Oh, for people who will stand up and say, I am a man of my word, or I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to keep my, my, my word. Oh, for people who will lead out and say, I'm not going to bend. I'm not going to fudge. I'm not going to bow. Oh, for Christian leaders of integrity in every realm of society, in leadership, in government roles, as teachers, men and women of integrity will say, we're going to do the right thing no matter what. What kind of place would it be if Christians were known because Jesus Christ was Lord, they were going to do the right thing no matter what. You see, then we'd start to become the kind of people that God wants us to be. Oh, for people of integrity in business and leadership and government and every walk of life, devoted to Christ, living holy lives. Then he comes down and gives us a fourth characteristic, another mark of maturity, and that's a readiness to defend our hope. If you've got a, a new Bible and you haven't written in it yet, this might be a place to start. I want you to notice what he says in, in the second half of that verse. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. Always be prepared to give this defense an answer. And as you look at, look at that verse, first of all, I want you to stop and, and look closely. The first thing I want you to notice is I want you to notice what that verse does not say. Here's what this verse does not say. It does not say you have to have a, an answer for every question. It doesn't say you have to defend every, everything that comes and is leveled against Christ. It doesn't say you have to be apologist in every sense of the word. You don't have to know all the supposed contradictions in scripture. You don't have to go and, and defend every difficult passage. You don't have to answer all the skeptics' uh, reasons why they don't believe in God. It doesn't say you have to have, be ready to give every answer to every question, does it? Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for what? For this one thing, you don't have to answer every question. You don't have to know the answer to every objection. You don't have to be able to demolish every single argument. But here's the thing you need to do. You need to be able to give the answer for this question. Why do you have so much hope? Why are you so hopeful? As you go through life and as things are difficult, as you're being persecuted, as charges are being leveled against you, that's what was happening in the first century, as people mock you and criticize you and ridicule for your faith in God, why is it that you have so much hope? Where is your hope found? Give this defense for this one thing, simply one thing you need to be able to do. Why do you have so much hope? Why are you so hopeful? And we need to be able to stop and say, let me tell you why I have hope, because I believe in Jesus. See, I, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that Jesus reconciled me to God. I believe that this life is just a temporary place where for those people who really believe in Jesus and make him Lord of their life, there's a place better than this. You see, I'm hopeful because all the pain and suffering in this world, they're just temporary. You see, I'm so hopeful because I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and one day we'll live with him forever. You see, I believe all the hardship we're going through now will pale in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ is Lord. All you have to do is say, why are you so hopeful? And I'm hopeful because of Jesus Christ and the fact that he died on the cross. I'm hopeful because Jesus reconciled us to God. Give this one answer. I believe in Jesus. And because of Jesus, we have hope. Any amens there? Just this one thing. You don't have to answer every question. You don't have to demolish every argument. Simply be prepared to give an answer for the hope that's within you. Well, there are a couple of prerequisites to that, to that. First of all, this assumes that people are watching you and as you go through difficult times in your life, they see that you've got hope. As you go through hardships, that these things don't 
squelch you. Is that the right word? That these things don't squish you. That as you go through difficult times in life, you still are a person in hope. So live in such a way that your hope causes other people to notice. And then it tells us this. When they notice, you're able to give an answer for that hope that lives in you. That you're willing to answer. Here's the reason why I have hope. But notice, it takes words. Actions are no substitute for words. Uh, we, we know that, that words are no substitute for action. That really it's not do as I, uh, uh, do as I say, not as I do. We, we realize that we have to have actions. But also notice this. If we have the right actions, there's also come a, uh, comes a time when we've got to We've got to be able to speak for the hope that's in us. And so just as words are, are no substitute for actions, actions are no substitute for words. We've got to be able to say, here's why I have hope. Paul says in, in Romans chapter 10, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if we've never heard about him? And how, how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? There's a point where our actions and our hopefulness is not enough. We've got to be able to stop and say, can I tell you why I am so hopeful. We're supposed to make a defense. Now, it's interesting that it says there to be able to make a defense for the hope that's in you. It's actually, that, that word make a defense is actually the word apologia, where we get our word apologetics from that. To be able to give an answer, not to every question, but give an answer, why are you so hopeful? You know, there's a, a great story that there, there's this guy um, in scripture, and he's born blind. You probably remember the story. Jesus actually heals him by taking mud and putting it on his eyes. But the scribes and Pharisees, they're really trying to attack Jesus and find a, a way to accuse him. And so they go and they're, they're trying to find out how did Jesus do this miracle. And they first actually go to the guy's parents and say, hey, is that your son? And they say, yeah, that's our son. And, and he was blind. Yes, he was blind. Well, how did he receive his sight? And they say, yeah, you're going to have to go talk to him because they're a little scared of the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees. And so, hey, we don't know how that happened, but you go ask him. And so they take their questions to the blind man. And again, they're trying to find fault with him. Now, do you really believe he's a prophet? We, we believe he's a sinner. And how in the world can a sinner give you sight? And they're asking him questions. They're trying to find a reason to attack Jesus or, or criticize Jesus. And the blind man simply says, you know what? I can't answer all those questions. But this one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. He doesn't answer all their questions. He's not able to, to, to counter all their ar arguments. But he simply says, let me tell you the reason for the hope that I have. I realize this one thing, that Jesus was the one who healed me. Can't answer all your questions, but this one thing I know, be ready to give a hope, a reason for the hope that you have in Jesus. I wanna tell you that Jesus needs witnesses, not prosecuting attorneys. And the truth of the matter is we sometimes think that we have to know all the answers and we give the answers in a way that's argumentative and belligerent and angry. And actually when we do it that way, we go against one of the marks of maturity, which he tells us that really the last mark of maturity is having a clean conscience. He tells us to be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us, but do it, and notice the language, with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience. Interesting words, gentleness and respect. A, a clear conscience, a good conscience. Let me just kind of define those words for you. This word gentleness here actually carries the idea with it of being approachable. Being approachable. When you answer, you need to, to live your life in such a way that people are going to come up and say, hey, why do you have hope? And you, you're going to answer them gently and, and with, with uh, this idea of re, uh, uh, being approachable with respect and reverence, showing proper respect for both God and other people. And we realize that our outward actions should be above reproach. That, that people should be willing to come to us and say, what is it that you have that I don't have? We, we need to live lives of personal integrity before people will ever come. And we've got to live lives that show our hopefulness. And so when we have the opportunity, we're not belligerent, we're not proud, we're not arrogant, we're not Bible thumpers. We're simply able to share Christ with people that need to know. I, I love this, this passage. He says, you know what? We're going to go through hard times. But be willing to do what's right no matter what. And here's what's interesting. You're going to go through hard times whether you're a Christian or not. See, the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. You're going to be, be in difficult circumstances no matter what. And so Peter reminds us, you know what? It's better to suffer for doing good, if it should be God's will, than for doing evil. Isn't it? 
You're going to suffer no matter what. You're going to go through hardships no matter what. So why not go through it as a person of integrity? Why not go through it because you know God's watching and he's willing to, to strengthen you and establish you? Why not do the right thing? Because it's certainly better to, to go through hardship when you know you're doing the right thing than when you know you're, you're getting punished for what you actually did. If you're going to suffer, shouldn't it be for God's will? And so he reminds us that we've got to be eager to do good no matter what. We've got to be willing to stand up and do the right thing, even if it means suffering. We've got to be completely devoted to Jesus Christ. When people ask us, why? Give, give the reason for your, the, the hope, but give a reason in a way that's gentle and kind and respectful of both man and God. And, and realize that you're going to suffer no matter what. So you might as well do it with God on your side. It's a great passage about what it looks like to be a mature Christian. But I've got to stop and say, it's a difficult passage, isn't it? Really, you're saying, I will be a person of integrity, that Jesus is Lord of my life in every situation. And I'm going to do the right thing, even if it means being mocked or ridiculed, even if it means being called on the carpet by my boss for not fudging the books, even if it means people mocking me and scoffing at me. We, we need people who are going to stand up and say, I'm going to do the right thing no matter what. We need people who will say, I'm going to live a Christian life in season and out of season. I'm going to live for Christ in every circumstance in my life. And that's what it looks like to really come to maturity in Christ. So what should we do with a passage like this? I want to give you several responses. Uh, really, they come right out of this text itself. First of all, I think it starts here. I think it starts by, by praying, God, I want to become the kind of person you want me to be. God, I want to grow to maturity and so God, give me this eagerness to, to do good. God, give me the desire and, and the opportunity to, to live out my life in a Christian way. God, give me a heart of compassion and tenderness that really wants to meet the needs of other people. In fact, God, I want a devoted uh, spirit that you are Lord of every area in my life. And so I'm going to surrender to you. And Father, as I do that, I want, I want to have a hope in my life that other people can see. I want to live above the fray. I want to live above the darkness around me. And I want to live a life that's hopeful. Not negative. Not a lacking hope. But a life that's hopeful. And so others can see Christ in me. And so, Father, give me the ability and the opportunity to share. And so I think it starts by saying, God, I'm all in. Count on me. I want to, I want to, to, to live for you completely. Well, there's another thing. We're supposed to be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in, in, within us. And so maybe we need to really start saying, okay, why do, I, why do I have hope? And the Bible tells us, study to show yourself approved, or in our new, new version, do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And so we need to know what is the reason for your hope and be able to say to other people, here's the hope that lives within me. I think we also need to look to, for opportunities to show goodness. And just think about this for a second. What would it look like if this week, maybe even somebody that's, that's hard to deal with, maybe somebody that's ridiculing you because of your faith in Christ, maybe somebody that's actually in some small way persecuting you, what would it look like to really show goodness to them? To be generous and unselfish and, and showing kind, uh, uh, kindness and thoughtfulness to them. What would that look like? And what would it look like for you to go out and say, I'm gonna be the hands and feet of Jesus. How could you touch the life of someone else this week? What would that look like? And even more difficult, what would it look like if you're doing that to someone who, who yet has faith in Jesus? You see, that's what Peter's calling us to. These are the marks of maturity, to show goodness. And when the opportunities arise, we're going to share. We often get, get, don't get results because we don't, we don't try. What would it look like to say, can I tell you the reason why I'm so hopeful? Um, it's not, it, it doesn't need to be complicated. Simply give a reason for the hope that's in you. Do you have hope in Christ Jesus? Are you looking forward to a bright future? Simply give the reason for the hope that's in you. And finally, the theme of 1 Peter has really been conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. In fact, let me take you back to the, the theme of this section. It's simply verse 12. Keep your conduct honorable so they may see your good deeds and glorify God. You see, Peter is calling us to go deep Peter's actually calling us to grow up in Christ Jesus and become the kind of people he created us to be in the, in the first place. People that are people of integrity, that we're looking for opportunities to show glory to God by the way we treat other people. And so he's simply saying, look and be eager to do good no matter what. 
be completely devoted to Christ, and in so doing, be able to give a reason for the hope that's within you, and do that in a way that's gentle and kind, because in that way we promote Christ. So that's what it looks like to be mature in him. I said the one thing I want most for my kids. I want them to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and present them mature in Christ. What about you for your kids and your grandkids? But I want to tell you that's my desire for you as well and for our church. What would it look like if as a church we took the steps necessary to grow to maturity? Would you pray with me? Father, that's our desire. We want to serve you as Lord with our whole heart, with our whole lives. Uh, Father, we, we, want to, we want to be able to be your hands and feet and to spread goodness and kindness and generosity. We want to demonstrate faithfulness to you. And so, Father, help us surrender our lives to you as Lord, as boss. You're the one that's in charge. And as we do that, give us the opportunity to be able to share the reason for the hope that's within us. And Father, let us do that with gentleness and respect. And that's our prayer. We pray this in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen.